Hello and welcome to Cleveland Classic Cinema. Tonight's movie is 1939's The Return of Dr. X, directed by Vincent Sherman. X, weird symbol of humanity's most dangerous secret. The forbidden barrier that science must never cross. But in an amazing climax to a revolutionary medical discovery, its terrible power is delivered into the ruthless hands of a man the world once destroyed. A revenge-haunted genius, taking his name from the unknown inferno from which he returns. Dr. X, the mark of a madman who lives to kill, and who must kill to live. Dr. Xavier? Yes, I am Dr. Xavier. You can't be. I'll be very careful. I've always been careful, even though I had to kill. About me. I didn't have to. They found out for themselves. You're lying. Shh. Does he know everything? No, only that I brought you back to life. I should really kill you, Flake, for what you've done to me. Only give me a little longer. One week. That's all. There's a killer loose in the city, and you can help us find him. I told you I don't know anything. What about that full of cane? What about cane? My work ended not in failure, but in disaster. Disaster for me, disaster for Mr. X. The necessity for additional transfusions of human blood became increasingly frequent. Gentlemen, I am responsible for the... From the mid-1920s to about 1960, the output of Hollywood was controlled by what was referred to as the studio system. The owners of the major studios, those being Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, Warner Brothers, Fox, Paramount, and RKO, were called the Big Five and controlled all aspects of the filmmaking process from script to distribution. The studios also owned the theaters their movies were shown in and dictated what films would be shown and when. If you ever watched an old movie that really sucked and wondered how, you know, just how it ever got into theaters, there's your answer. The Little Three, Columbia, United Artists, and Universal, were run the same way but owned a smaller portion of the business. There were over 15,000 theaters in America at one time, and nearly all of them were owned by the studios. The independent theaters were victims of a process known as block booking. The studios would offer a popular A movie to the theaters, but they were forced to accept a number of lowercase a and b pictures as a package. The studio spared no expense in building their own motion picture houses. They were called picture palaces and they certainly earned the name. The average cost of a movie ticket during the depression was 15 cents and for your money you got an entire evening's entertainment. There would be a newsreel, a short subject usually produced by an independent studio such as Hal Roach Pathé or one produced by a studio short subject branch, a cartoon, and finally, <clears throat> the A picture, sometimes followed by a B picture. While this was good for the studios and the audience, the theater owners and or operators pretty much got the short end of the stick, and that kind of continues to this day. If you've ever wondered why you paid nearly 10 bucks for 50 cents worth of popcorn and six bucks 
for less cola than you could get at a lo the local 7-Eleven for a third that much money, it's because the theaters make most of their money from concessions. I myself don't begrudge the theaters the money they make from the concessions. I mean, you know, I certainly don't like paying that much for popcorn and candy, but they have to stay in business somehow. Getting back to the studio system, they exercise control not only over product, but the stars that appeared in them. While the top star could make as much as $400,000 a year at that time, that'd be close to $7 million adjusted for inflation, they were held firmly under the thumb of the studio heads. A star appeared in whatever film the studio dictated whether, whether they were right for the part or not. At times, the studio deliberately miscast a star in a movie as a form of punishment, which brings us to tonight's film. In 1938, Humphrey Bogart married an actress named Mayo Methol. Both had been married previously, and both were heavy drinkers. The difference between the two was that Mayo was a violent, combative drunk. The fact that she would attack, public, uh, she would attack Bogey in public earned the couple the sobriquet of the battling Bogarts, and Mayo became known as Sluggy. Bogart named his motor yacht Sluggy in her honor. While traveling in Europe during World War II entertaining the troops, the couple met up with director John Huston in Italy. During a night of hard partying, Mayo insisted that everyone listen to her sing a song. Although everyone refused, she did it anyway and was embarrassingly terrible. Years later, Houston and Bogart remembered this incident and inspired a scene in 1948's Key Largo, wherein Claire Trevor, as the alcoholic girlfriend of gangster Edward G. Robinson, sang a song drunk and off-key. During one fight at their home, Mayo stabbed Bogart in the shoulder. Warners managed to keep it out of the papers, but the violence was beginning to escalate, coming to a head when Mayo pulled a gun at a Hollywood party and threatened to kill Bogart. Because of the grief the fights were causing the studio, Bogey was punished by being assigned the title role in tonight's movie. The role was originally meant for Boris Karloff, who probably didn't regret losing it to Bogart. Remembering the film, Bogart once said, you can't believe what this one was like. I had a part that somebody like Bela Lugosi or Boris Karloff should have played. I was this doctor brought back to life and the only thing that nourished this poor bastard was blood. If it had been Jack Warner's blood or Harry's or Pop's, maybe I wouldn't have minded as much. The trouble was, they were drinking mine and I was making a stinking movie. Although he hated the part, Bogart was a pro. He showed up on set on time, knew his lines, and hit his marks and did the best for his director. Although it sounds like a sequel, this movie has absolutely nothing to do with the 1932 film Dr. X. It concerns a nosy reporter, is there any other kind? who discovers an actress dead in her apartment and writes a story about it, only to be fired when the actress herself shows up at the paper, threatening to sue them over the story. The reporter is fired, of course, but he notices how pale and listless the formerly dead actress is and begins investigating with a doctor friend. This leads him to Dr. Keene, a pale weirdo with a white streak in his hair and a pet rabbit. He displays the same symptoms as the undead actress, and this gets the reporter's curiosity going even more. I don't want to ruin the movie for you, so let's get to the bio, shall we? Humphrey Bogart was born Humphrey DeForest Bogart on December 25, 1899 in New York City. He appeared in 77 films over the course of his career, starting with 1928's The Dancing Town, and appeared in a few other films while mostly doing stage work. His big break came in 1936 when a stage play he had appeared in, The Petrified Forest, was made into a film. Edward G. Robinson was slated to play the part of Duke Manti in the film, but co-star Leslie Howard threatened to quit the production if Bogart wasn't given the role. Howard had appeared in the Broadway production of the play opposite Bogart, who had originated the role, and he felt that no one else could play it as well. Howard had enough clout at the time to get his way, and the role made Bogart a star. Oddly, many of his best roles were ones that another star of the time, George Raft, had been offered but turned down, including the leads in High Sierra and the Maltese Falcon. He started out studying medicine at Phillips University and after being expelled, joined the U.S. Naval Reserve. In the early 20s, he managed a stage company and worked behind the scenes in a New York film studio. After this, he began making regular stage appearances and landed a two-year contract with 20th Century Fox before winning a long-term contract with Warner Brothers following the success of 1936's The Petrified Forest. 
He appeared in mostly minor roles in gangster films and twice in westerns. Bogart was a well-read, erudite man and knew the, a good part when he read one, snapping up lead roles in 1941's High Sierra and the Maltese Falcon, and two of my personal favorites, 1942's Casablanca and 1948's Key Largo, among many others. Bogart was one of the few actors brave enough to confront the House Un-American Activities Committee regarding the communist witch hunts of the 50s. Married four times, he finally found happiness with his last wife, Lauren Bacall, who he met on the set of 1944's To Have and Have Not, which gave the world the famous, if you want anything, just whistle scene. Actually, that scene wasn't part of the original script. Director Howard Hawks wrote it as a screen test for Bacall. This was her first movie. And it went over so well that Hawks asked screenwriter William Faulkner to add it to the film. Humphrey Bogart died from throat cancer on January 14, 1957 in Los Angeles, California. Lauren McCall put a small gold whistle in the casket with him. Wayne Morris was born Bert DeWayne Morris on February 17, 1914 in Los Angeles, California. After graduating high school, he worked as a forest ranger for a while and before entering college and studying acting at the Pasadena Playhouse. After being discovered by a Warner Brothers talent scout, he was signed to the studio and appeared in 29 pictures between 1936 and 1941, including landing the title role in the 1937 boxing drama Kit Galahad. He entered the Naval Reserve and became a Naval Flyer during the war, shooting down seven enemy planes and assisting in the sinking of five ships. He was awarded four distinguished flying crosses and two air medals during his service. When he returned to Hollywood, his star had faded and he was relegated to low-budget features and westerns. He had a career-reviving role in Stanley Kubrick's 1957 classic Paths of Glory, but unfortunately he died from a massive heart attack on September 14, 1959 in Oakland, California. He was only 45 years old. Dennis Morgan was born Earl Stanley Mourner on December 20, 1908 in Prentice, Wisconsin. Active in high school plays and glee club, he later attended Carroll College in Wisconsin and studied voice at the Conservatory of Music in the American Conservatory. Before entering films, he toured with national theater companies performing operas such as Carmen and Faust. He landed a contract with MGM in the 30s, and after playing a series of bit parts in various films, he made the big time playing opposite Ginger Rogers in 1940's Kitty Foyle. He began starring in films after that, eventually teaming up with his friend Jack Carson, making 15 films together, including 1946's Two Guys from Milwaukee, 1948's Two Guys from Texas, and 1949's It's a Great Feeling. Originally cast to play Rick Blaine in Casablanca, he passed on the role to appear in 1943's Thank Your Lucky Stars. He shuttled between movies and television, working steadily into the 60s when he semi-retired. His last roles were three appearances on The Love Boat in 1980. Dennis Morgan died of respiratory failure on September 7, 1994 in Fresno, California. Rosemary Lane was born Rosemary Mulliken on April 4, 1914 in Indianola, Iowa. She appeared in 21 films over the course of her short movie career, mainly acting and singing on stage. She got her start along with her sisters Leota, Lola, and Priscilla singing for Fred Waring and his Pennsylvanians. They appeared together with the band in 1937's Varsity Show, starring Dick Powell. She appeared mostly in musicals, obviously, and made a, freight, but made a few straight movies like tonight's film. She pretty much just plays a victim in this movie. She retired from the screen in 1939 and went back to Broadway, where she enjoyed a long career, moving into real estate after settling in Pacific Palisades. Rosemary Lane died on November 25, 1974, in Woodland Hills, Los Angeles, California. The Return of Dr. X isn't a bad film. It isn't a, it isn't a good film, either. Its feet are solidly planted in the B area. It's actually a pretty good example of something I mentioned in past intros, a production to fill the lower half of a double bill of one of the many, many pictures cranked out on a regular basis by the major studios to keep the theaters filled with product. Take it on that basis, it's, it's okay. So right now, sit back, relax, and enjoy the return of Dr. X, right here on Cleveland Classic Cinema. <laughs>